Okay, I'll get us underway. So uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm Chris Humphrey, the Executive Director at the EU ASEAN Business Council. Welcome to this latest webinar um, during this COVID period. Today, we are talking about investing in the COVID era, uh, a crisis impact across asset classes and the investment outlook. Um, we are very privileged today to have a great panel and an excellent moderator um, who should need no introduction to many of you, but I will introduce him anyway. It's Donald Kanak. He is the chairman of Eastspring Investments, and amongst the many hats he also wears, he's also chairman of the EU ASEAN Business Council um, and has been for some time. So I think without further ado, I will hand over to Don to introduce the panel and get the discussion going. So Don, all yours. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joined us for this session. Um, this is a session that uh, we, we wanted to have um, uh, for the last couple of months. Um, in a certain sense, I'm glad that we've taken some time to pull it together. Um, it's given us a bit more time, I think, all of us who are participating and all of you who are listening uh, to know more about how COVID is developing. And I think we can um, have an even more interesting discussion today than we would have had had we had this session two months ago. The word unprecedented is overused, and I'll use it again. The economic impact of this crisis, I think, is unprecedented in a number of ways. Um, in terms of the number of countries that are impacted and the impact across essentially every sector of society. Um, and it's not just the countries that have had high rates of infection and high rates of mortality that have been impacted, even countries that have had relatively low rates of infection have had serious economic impacts, especially uh, when those countries' economies have a high concentration of certain industries, such as tourism or hospitality or travel. So no one has been immune from this. And we all know that the amount of uncertainty um, continues to be high. Um, it's uncertainty about the economic impacts that um, will continue to happen for, for businesses of all types and all sizes, uh, uncertainty about the steps that governments will take in the future, will be able to take, uh, and the steps that central banks will take. And those, as we know, have massive implications for the investing decisions that have to be made. And uncertainty around the future trajectory of COVID itself. Um, we still don't have viable vaccines. We don't know when those will be available. We don't know how effective they will be when they are available. And we certainly don't know how quickly they'll be able to be distributed, especially when we consider the varying capacities of countries across the world and within our region in terms of their pharmaceutical and healthcare delivery infrastructure. So all of that uncertainty makes it difficult for all of us who are operating day to day, whatever our walks of life are, including all of you who are calling into this call, it certainly makes this a challenging and complex environment in which to make investment decisions. We're fortunate today to have, uh, I believe, three speakers, but we, at the moment we only have two of our speakers online, so we hope we'll have our third speaker by the time uh, we get to that point of the conversation. If not, we'll be well covered by the speakers that we have. Before I introduce our speakers, and we kick off the session, I just want to mention a couple of points. Um, one is that as we're going along, I would encourage everyone to use the Q&A or chat function on your screens to ask questions. Um, we'll be collating those questions as we go along and we hope we can have a good discussion based on the audience's questions that you will write in. So please don't hold back, uh, be writing those questions as we go along. The second thing I want to do is to draw your attention to the words at the bottom of this page, which you see, which are important uh, in the sense of disclosure and important in terms of financial regulation. So I'm gonna read this to you, but I want you to look at it together with me. The information provided and opinions expressed in this webinar should not be construed as an offer or solicitation for the subscription purchase or sale of any securities mentioned herein. Any opinion or estimate contained in this webinar is subject to change without notice. We've not given any consideration and we have not made any investigation of the investment objective, financial situation, or particular needs of the recipient or any class of persons and accordingly no warranty whatsoever is given and no liability whatsoever is accepted.
for any loss arising, whether directly or indirectly, or as a result of the recipient or any class of persons acting on such information or opinion or estimate. Past performance and the prediction, projections, or forecasts on the economy, securities markets, or economic trends of the markets are not necessarily indicative of future or likely performance. So having said that, and everybody I know listened to that, and you know we're not giving investment advice, but this is a sharing of, of ideas and thoughts, and we appreciate the opportunity to do that. Let me start and briefly introduce our, our first speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Bill Maldonado. Uh, Bill is the Chief Investment Officer and of Asia Pacific uh, and the Global Chief Investment Officer of Equities for HSBC Global Asset Management. Bill has had a long and varied, varied career in the sense of various asset classes. Um, since 1993, he's been in, in, in the investment world um, and he's worked across a wide range of securities and, and also alternatives, derivatives and other alternative assets. So I, I think it's great for Bill to be able to kick us off today and sort of in a sense, give us his views um, about this environment and maybe a bit of perspective across different asset classes. Thank you, Bill. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Don. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can uh, all see that. So um, I'll get us started, as, as Don says, try and give you a bit of an overview of, of the way we see the world and, and what's happened and what will happen in, as, as we continue to, to recover from this, from this crisis. So um, on this first slide, um, I think this is kind of the anatomy of, of, the, of the crisis as far as the economy is uh, concerned. So we had a very sharp, large, precipitous fall in, in economic activity. It was like a machine that was running that suddenly had the, the electricity switched off. It almost came to a complete halt. Um, there followed very strong policy support, fiscal and monetary support. Um, and uh, as the disease came under control, um, we've seen a sharp bounce uh, from, from the lows. Uh, and we're probably at or around this, this point B now where we've seen the best of the rebound. And from now on, it's going to be a flatter kind of recovery. Uh, and so this, is, this whole picture looks like a swoosh so this this presentation is is uh, about sushonomics and 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 why why the swoosh and and what we can expect. So very big picture. That's that's what we're seeing. Um, to just put a little bit more detail on 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 what's going on. So um, we expect the U.S. to continue to outperform in terms of its recovery versus other developed markets. Um, you can see that here on, on the picture on the left. Um, but all economies have been very badly impacted. You can see how precipitous the fall has been, how sharp it's been, and, and how flat U-shaped the recovery is. I think it's generous to even call it a swoosh at this point, but, but maybe it's, it's, it's about to pick up steam a little bit. On the other hand, um, emerging markets and closer to home, China and India have done a lot better. So you see China's economy also having a very, very sharp fall in terms of economic activity, but actually halting that fall before it goes into negative GDP territory. Um, India actually having an, an even shallower fall and, and also apparently halting that before it goes into negative territory. And then you see other emerging markets, typically those with more fragile economies, with larger deficits, with um, more vulnerable currencies, having a much tougher time and looking more like the developed economies of the world than the emerging economies of, of China and India. So that's kind of what's happened so far and, and, and maybe gives you uh, an idea in numbers of, of what's been happening. I think one of the interesting things um, to, to talk about, and, and perhaps we'll have some questions on this, is in the face of that um, horrible um, drawdown in the economy, both on the demand side of the economy and on the supply side of the economy, and we'll say a little bit more about that 
in a second. But in that, in that, in, in that calamitous fall in, in the economy and um, with the disease still not gone away, still causing havoc in, in many or even most countries in the world, how come um, assets are doing so well? And in particular, how come equity markets are doing so well? Isn't that completely irrational? And I think the answer is that it's not irrational, uh, that, it's, that it's pricing in something somewhere between a swoosh recovery, the flatter part of that swoosh that I showed you at the beginning, and a sharper V-shaped recovery. And, and let me explain what I mean, and I think there are two key things to, to focus on here. The first one is that interest rates are now incredibly low around the world, and they're set to remain low for a very considerable period of time. So a sort of lower for longer type environment. That's very relevant to equity markets because one of the ways of, of thinking about equity markets is in terms of the net present value of the cash flows that investing in those equities bring us. And if our discount rate, if interest rates, if our discount rate is very, very low, then the net present value of that cash flow actually goes up, not down. Furthermore, when you have very low rates, you become less sensitive to when those cash flows arise. If you have high interest rates, then it's important for you to, for those cash flows to arise now or, or as close to now as possible. If interest rates are very low, then the discount factor is, is, is very low and you, you're much less sensitive to, to when those interest rates will arise. So that's what's happened. And, 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 and therefore, what, what the market is pricing in is a very sharp decline in dividends and earnings this year, and then a recovery in those um, dividends and earnings from next year. And it's interesting to look at, well, what, what might those earnings in dividends be over the next few years, over the next two to five years? If it's only 5%, we'd say that's, that's kind of close to a stagnation scenario. And, and one year after the onset of the crisis, we'll still be below the pre-pandemic peak. If we get to the pre-pandemic peak within one year, by, say, the end of the first quarter of next year, um, and growth in the following two to five years around the 6% mark, then that seems to reflect the swoosh recovery. And then it's possible we could do a bit better than that. Maybe actually dividends end up higher than they were a year ago. Uh, and they grow a bit faster in, in the subsequent years. So which of these three scenarios does the equity market seem to be pricing in? And the answer is, if you look at equities today and their trajectory, it's somewhere between the swoosh recovery, the base case scenario that we've been focusing on, and a rapid recovery. It's somewhere between those two. So it's not pricing in anything more than that. You might already feel that this is pricing in quite a bit. It's already very optimistic. But, but for many people, for us included, this is kind of a base case scenario. So although it feels strange that equities and, and other assets have done so well, actually they're not pricing in much, um, much that's extraordinary. The additional thing to say is that um, from here on in, it's difficult to see equities and indeed other asset classes producing the kinds of returns that we've experienced since June or even since March or even year to date where the, where the annualized returns are actually quite high. I think we can expect much more um, boring returns from these asset classes, sort of mid to high single digits per annum, uh, but still compared to very low interest rates, compared to effectively zero rates and extremely low yields on on government bonds, those returns are attractive over the medium to long term, but they're not going to make you a lot of money in the short term, if I can, if I can put it that way. Here you see what returns have been this year, and as, as, as we've called this chart, there's a rally in everything. Very surprisingly, gold is the best performing asset class this year. That gives away a little bit of a hint about this, this recovery, because normally at a time like this, when you've got low inflation, 
low interest rates and a, and a massive amount of stimulus going into the market and you don't see much inflation, you wouldn't expect gold to do very well. But it, but it has done very well. Uh, and I think that's because people are very risk averse. They're still very worried about the economy despite the performance of, of markets. And then you see all the other asset classes from government bonds through corporate debt, emerging market and equities, all in positive territory. The diamond is where they are year to date. The, the sort of bar is the range over which they've been this year. So it's a huge range. Equities were down 30, 40%. Now they're up about 10%. So it's massive. Commodities have had an even greater kind of range over which they've traveled. Um, but basically everything is up. Um, we can talk a little bit about uh, one of our later speakers will probably touch on the different um, styles in equities uh, later on. Uh, and then finally, uh, let me, I'll probably finish up on, on, on this slide uh, or, or just quickly on the next one. Another question that we get a lot of is why has the US done so much better in the sort of three phases of, of, this, of this recovery from the COVID crisis, the sort of very early phase when all the stimulus went in, the second phase when the disease seemed to be coming under control, and then this third phase where, where the, the market has, has continued to recover and we've seen some recovery in earnings. Why has the US done so much better than other markets? And I think the answer is there's nothing particularly special about the US economy or market that's made it have that performance. Um, the answer actually lies in the, in the sectorial differences. So uh, in the US, the market is very overweight relative to um, Europe uh, and, and other developed markets in IT and healthcare. And those sectors have done extremely well. They're the ones that have led us out of, 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 of the crisis that have performed very strongly. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we equalize the market performances between Europe and the US for sectors, actually the different markets would perform broadly in line with each other. And as I said earlier, uh, I think Anu, if, if she comes on, will talk about the, the, the different styles. Um, and, and then just finally to show you, this is what's getting called the K-shaped recovery, which is a little bit of a puzzle. This is an attempt at illustrating the K. This is what people mean. So it's kind of in the shape of a K if you squint your eyes and look at it at a funny angle. And all that people are saying is that the recovery in markets is very, very sector dependent. And there's a huge variation between the best performing sectors and the worst performing sectors. So here the worst performing sectors are financials, real estate, industrials. The best performing sectors are IT, telecoms and consumer discretionary. In the middle, you've probably got materials and, and consumer staples. And, and it's obvious why some sectors are doing much better than others. What that means, of course, is that the sectors that have been very resilient and have done very well through the crisis are now extremely expensive. They're very, very expensive. Some of these IT names, some of the e-commerce names are trading on, on crazy PE multiples. On, on, on the other side, um, these more cyclical names, financials, real estate, are trading at extremely low multiples, but there isn't yet an obvious catalyst that's going to turn these things around and allow them to perform. But I guess if you're bargain hunting, this is where you do it. If you um, want to go with the status quo and, and play in the more defensive spaces, then this is where you would do it. So Don, let, let me finish there and, and hand back to you. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Bill. Um, that's a great overview. And I think you've given us some interesting um, uh, things to ponder there. And uh, we've already begun to get some questions, but it, I would encourage people to continue to send in questions. And we'll start that after we hear from our next speaker, Andrew Naylor. Andrew, thank you for agreeing to speak today. Uh, Bill did refer to, to the role of, that gold has been playing um, in the year to date as one of the uh, better performing asset classes. Um, and, and I think therefore it makes, it, we're grateful to have yourself on the line to be able to talk from the perspective of, of a group which is 
um, all about gold. So briefly to introduce Andrew, Andrew uh, joined the World Gold Council in 2016, currently heads ASEAN, Australia, Japan, and Korea, overseeing the expansion of the World Gold Council's activities in the region, including a renewed focus on investment. He's also the global head of public policy and is responsible for the council's regulatory policy and initiatives. Um, I actually met Andrew a few years ago before he joined the Gold Council when he was consulting to international financial institutions on foreign investment and the regulatory reform agenda and trade policy uh, when he was with Cicero Group. So, Andrew, thank you very much for sponsoring today and for speaking. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Don, and thanks to the, uh, the Council for um, putting this um, webinar together and to everybody for, for joining. Um, just before I, I talk about uh, the impact of COVID on gold, um, I just thought it'd be useful just to introduce very briefly the World Gold Council, um, because I'm, I'm conscious that uh, we're a fairly niche organization, but we, we are the International Market Development Organization for gold. Uh, we do three things. We produce a lot of research and data um, and analysis that's, uh, that's freely available, um, uh, but we also work with central banks and governments on gold reserve management, the regulatory treatment of gold, and we also set standards that cover um, the entire supply chain. A recent one is the Responsible Gold Mining Principles, which is a sustainability initiative, and we've, we've launched uh, principles for the retail market as well. Um, so that's the World Gold Council. Just in terms of, of gold, it is a global market. Over 50% of physical demand uh, is, is in Asia. Um, uh, and that's in numerous different forms, which I'll talk about in a bit. But I just wanted to set a bit of context about the role that gold plays in, in Asia. Um, for many, um, certainly in the retail market, it is a, a primary savings vehicle. It's often used as a, as a life insurance policy. Um, and as a, as a primary financial asset in ASEAN. The bigger markets for the, in the retail sector would be Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and, and Indonesia. Um, but it also has a role uh, in institutional finance as well, which is obviously uh, more, in, in this region, more dominated by, uh, by, by Singapore. But it plays a very important role. And we're actually, we, we, um, we've just commissioned some research that's looking at uh, the role that gold plays in Vietnam in, in particular. Um, so that's, that's gold and, and ASEAN. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the, the impact of, of COVID. Um, Bill, in his presentation, obviously um, alluded to the fact that, that gold has performed uh, uh, very well this year. Um, at its peak, it was up over about 30% um, uh, year to date. There has been quite a lot of volatility, but it has outperformed most other or all other um, major asset classes. Um, it's often viewed as a, as a commodity, um, which it is to some extent, but there's a big debate in finance as to whether it's, a, uh, it's more of a, a financial asset rather than a commodity. And it certainly behaves uh, in a very, very different way to, to both. Um, uh, it's often viewed as a, as a unique diversifier. If you look at its correlation uh, to other asset classes, um, uh, the correlations aren't particularly, aren't particularly strong. Um, so it's used as a, often used in an institutional sense as a, as a, as a portfolio um, a diversifier. But year to date, gold has performed well. The, the, there are a number of reasons for that. Um, and if you look at the, the, the primary reason for it was institutional investment, particularly uh, out of the West, so the US and Europe, uh, which is where most of the larger gold ETF products, exchange traded funds are uh, domiciled uh, and based. Um, but we've seen huge inflows this year. And as Bill said, one of the reasons, primary reasons for that is, is risk aversion and a need, to, um, a need for institutional investors to, to mitigate risk. But that's just one part of the, of the picture. Um, investment demand, uh, which is primarily ETF and, and uh, uh, ETF products, accounts for about 30% of, of annual demand. The rest comes from very, very different sectors, which have been impacted in very, very different ways. So the jewellery market, which, uh, which accounts for 
uh, just under half of, uh, of annual demand on average, um, if you look at the, the 10 year average, um, that's been significantly impacted by COVID for two reasons. One, it's retail market driven. Uh, retail investment tends to be, um, tends to react differently to, uh, to risk uh, when there's lots of risk on the horizon, consumers tend to uh, to invest less in, in gold, whereas institutions would, would allocate more. Um, so the jewellery market has been impacted by sort of that economic context, but also the logistical impact of, of COVID. Um, the fact that shops have been closed uh, has also had a, had a major impact. So if you look at retail investment, which is bar and coin and jewellery, that's actually down um, uh, quite significantly this year. Um, but what you tend to have is, and we, we call it the, the dual nature of gold, you have the investment demand for gold, which is, is more positively driven by uncertainty and is, is kind of sort of counter cyclical and retail demand, um, uh, which, is, which is a little bit more pro cyclical when the economy is doing well and the outlook is good, uh, retail investment tends to go up and that's the same uh, for technology investment, which ultimately is, um, is consumption uh, led as well. Um, but what you do see um, is that, that any weaknesses in consumer demand tend to be offset by, um, by a strengthening in, in the investment market. And that's certainly what, is, uh, what has happened um, so far this year. So on average, about 3,000 tons um, of gold is, is demanded. Um, but supply or fresh supply um, uh, uh, doesn't exceed that. In fact, um, um, supply of gold, fresh or mine supply of gold, counts to about uh, 2,000 tons. So the rest is met through, through recycling, which again gives it a, a unique uh, profile because it's, um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite an elastic um, uh, supply side um, uh, relationship with gold in that when demand is, is very, very high, it's often um, um, you get an uptick in, in recycling, for example, which meets that, that excess demand. But that is another, COVID has had another impact in that um, a lot of the major recycling centers um, for logistical reasons haven't been able to function as they would do normally. And so um, the, the reason gold has done well is both sort of supply and demand side um, uh, led, led issues. Um, I've mentioned, uh, I've mentioned ETFs. Uh, gold ETFs have been around um, for, uh, for about 17, 18 years now. Um, they're a popular way um, because of the equity wrapper. Um, and the, the World Gold Council was one of the first to, um, uh, to create a, a gold ETF. Um, but as I said this year, we've seen record, record inflows primarily driven um, by that risk, um, the risk aversion, if you like, um, and the number of factors as well behind that. The longer term outlook for interest rates um, is very, very low. There's still a lot of uncertainty on the horizon. This isn't a really a financial crisis. It's a public health crisis, and um, the the financial fallout um, um, is very, very different to previous crises. Um, in that the the solution isn't isn't in finance, whereas in you know, 2008, 2009, um, uh, the, you know, the problem was, was uh, you know, a financial sector driven problem and the solution to it was, uh, was um, found through a response from the financial sector. Whereas we're in a very, very different situation now with the public health crisis, a lot of uh, uncertainty. Um, and so that uncertainty coupled with a, um, a negative interest rate outlook um, uh, is, is contributing to um, uh, to increased investment demand for um, for, for gold. Um, so I mentioned the, the key outlook. Another big area of demand is central banks. Uh, central banks um, uh, um, behave in a in a more similar to 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 other institutional investors, but slightly differently. Um, but since 2010, central banks um, have been net buyers of gold. One of the reasons for that was the World Gold Council worked with central banks on something called the Central Bank Gold Buying Agreement. And that limited um, uh, purchases and sales of gold. And the reason for that was to try and 
reduce the impact that central bank buying behavior has on on the gold market. Uh, but nonetheless, since 2010 and the, the financial crisis, central banks have been net buyers of gold and most of uh, the incremental purchases of gold have been in, in emerging market central banks, which typically allocate less. So we've seen strong uh, buying behavior in, uh, in, in this region, for example, and that's likely to, um, uh, to continue. Um, and then another um, um, key trend to look out for is, is what we refer to as momentum. Um, there is um, um, uh, volatility around the gold price, which is one of the, the barriers that institutions sometimes have when they're thinking about gold. Um, but there are traders, obviously, who, um, uh, who take advantage of that. And that does tend to uh, contribute a little bit to, um, uh, to the, the, the higher prices that we've seen at the moment. Um, but a lot of it is, is still uh, strategic, uh, strategic investment. Um, I just want to briefly, I've got I think one minute, so, um, so I don't go over, I just want to talk very quickly about the, the case for gold. So why an institution would allocate to gold? First of all, returns, it does outperform uh, in the long run. Um, it doesn't provide a coupon, um, so income seeking investors um, uh, sometimes um, look less favorably on gold, but don't forget a coupon is paid for credit risk. And with gold, there isn't credit risk as long as you're holding physical gold. Um, um, so that's something different. It just, it does change the, the risk allocation uh, profile of your investment portfolio. So dis but despite the lack of a coupon or income, it does tend to outperform in the long run. I mentioned it's a good portfolio diversifier. Uh, there's a, a lack of, of correlation uh, to most other other asset classes, it performs very differently. And the reason for that is it's the unique sectoral profile of gold demand. There's no other asset where you have jewelry, central bank, uh, commercial investment and technology demand. Um, there isn't another asset really like that. And each of those sectors of demand uh, have very, very different motivations, um, be it whether it's a strategic allocation, um, duration of investment, reaction to um, to rising incomes and the nature of the economy. So uh, the, the structural profile of demand is very, very different and that, that's reflected in um, the lack of correlation that gold has to, to a lot of other assets, which means it's a, a useful diversifier. Um, it's also a liquid asset, over $145 billion of gold is traded every day, primarily in London OTC markets and in uh, the US futures markets, but there are big, trading centers as well um, in other markets, including in, in Shanghai and Hong Kong um, and, and other places as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a fairly liquid asset, um, trading about $145 billion a day. And it does tend to improve the risk adjusted returns of a, of a portfolio. We'd never advocate putting in uh, a huge, you know, 100% into, into, into gold, but a, a small allocation, a conservative allocation tends to um, improve the the risk adjusted returns of a of a portfolio so those are the um, uh, that's sort of why an institution is um, is interested in gold um, if you want more information goldhub.com is there it's all free um, uh, but we've got a lot of tools and research that can um, uh, sort of help explain the gold market and the role that, that gold plays And with that, I, 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 uh, that's the end of my presentation. So thank, thanks again, Don. Thank you, Andrew. Um, let me, um, let me, well, there have been a couple of questions. So let me, let me use, I have, I have some questions I um, have made note of as you've been, both of you have been presenting, but let me, let me turn to the, the questions that have come in first. Um, uh, one question is, is for Bill. Uh, and Bill, you might end up, responding to both of these, but Andrew, please weigh in. Uh, the first is about, um, are you too optimistic about the real economy in India? I didn't hear you, hear you say optimism in India, but anyway, given the very serious COVID-19 situation the country is in. So I, would you have anything you'd like to say about India? What, I'd like to pose that question as well. You know, if you want to, you could maybe look across ASEAN a bit. There's some very big differentials in the performance year to date within our region. Um, you know, look at the performance of Vietnam, for example, relative to um, several other markets in the region. And maybe as you're thinking about India, can you say anything about, in, you know, comparisons across sure. the markets? That would be very useful. 
Sure. So on India, uh, I think the, the question arises because of the GDP chart that I showed, which is, is sort of remarkable because, because it shows a very flat profile for, for India in terms of its economic drawdown. Um, and, and as ever, so, so that's not expressing an optimistic view about the economy going forward. That's just um, showing the data that has arisen. But I would say um, a couple of things. One, that is, in a way, unfortunately, a reflection of the fact that India's economy is not very industrialized. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make as many things as, as, say, other Asian countries. And, and so almost by definition, it's going to be less impacted by, by, by a disease or, 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 a, or an event like this, an exogenous shock, as Andrew said, a shock that's come from outside the financial economy, an exogenous shock that, that's shutting down the world economy. It's, it's, it's less sensitive to it, but the reason for that is, is not a great reason. Although interestingly, that, that, that resilience that India has because it's somewhat isolated from, from the global economy versus other economies also attracted a lot of attention, attracted a lot of flows during 2019, during the China-US trade dispute. India became a bit of a safe, safe haven um, because it wasn't so enmeshed with, with the global economy. In terms of the second part of the question, Don, on the difference in performance between different parts of ASEAN, and if I can take a bit of liberty and broaden that out to differences uh, across the broader region, what we observe is that um, the better, the more developed economies uh, like Singapore in, in ASEAN, but Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, outside of ASEAN, because of better health systems and better management, have had better crises on average, have had a lower impact on, on GDP. They've had less impact on the supply side of the economy. So factories and places where people make things have been able to get back online more quickly. And then Crucially, the demand side of the economy, so consumers, retail going out there and, and buying those goods, spending money, has also been less impacted. So they've had a better crisis, their economies are in better shapes, they've had to run up less of a deficit, they've had to worry less about defending their currencies, um, they've had a lot of benefits from doing that. Whereas um, the less developed economies like Indonesia have had at times difficulty with currencies, um, with, with supply and demand, with health systems, etc. So um, it's, it's definitely been kind of a, a tale of two, two, two different types of economy, the more developed and, and the less developed. Thank you. Andrew, do you have anything you, you want to add to that? I mean, I, India has been, a, I think, a major player in gold uh, uh, at different times. So I don't know whether you might comment on anything. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, when you, um, I mean, India is the, is the second largest um, gold market in terms of consumer demand. Um, uh, we're going to put it into context. I mean, they, they, um, when you look at physical demand, that's uh, very much... Um, an Asian-led story, um, but that's just one part of the gold market. Um, the, the sort of wholesale trading financial market for gold um, uh, takes place really in London and, and New York. But on, on, in the physical market side, I mean, gold has played a huge role in in, uh, in household, individual and household finances in, in India for for all sorts of reasons. But going back to to what Bill said, and you know, this, this is reflected in some of our data. So we um, we produce quarterly data on on demand. There is a there is quite a lag because it involves going around the various uh, jewelry shops and distributors across uh, across um, India and and the rest of the world, which obviously takes time. It's a survey based study, um, but our Q2 figures did see a, a slight uptick, um, certainly in China, which suggested that. Um, 
certainly consumer confidence was starting to return um but also you know the the, the impact of the lockdown in in china china was obviously the first to to be affected by covid and was the first to um uh, to emerge uh, in in some respect from it um whereas india is still lagging and is still you know still um uh, unfortunately impacted by uh by the virus whereas you know china's obviously got it under under uh, relative control. Um, but that's reflected in certainly in our demand statistics on the consumer side. Thank you. Um, you know, we we have, haven't so far focused on the political risks that might affect the markets or, or do affect the markets. Um, you know, we began the year before we saw COVID um, as the risk. I guess a lot of people saw the US, China, uh, disputes um, as one of the major risks facing the market, um, facing the region. Um, I, you know, there is now, that's U.S.-China, there's now, I guess, a U.S.-U.S. risk that some people are concerned about. Uh, and actually, one of the questions that came in from um, Munir Majid is that um, the U.S. market, having done better so far, but how do you feel the U.S. market would look after the presidential election if Trump loses and refuses to leave the White House? Um, that could be called a softball question in some circles, but <laughs> not, a, not a scenario that I suspect markets want to contemplate. So uh, th I think this is a, a very topical question right now. Um, this risk, and, it, and it's, I think it's fairly clear that, that the Trump campaign has kind of been setting the scene to 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 contest the election in, in some way on, on on postal ballots in in particular. There seems to be quite a bit of evidence for that, and and hence I think the market is is right to be concerned about it. Um, I suspect that at this point the risk is over discounted. That's not to say that the risk can't materialize. But I think it's been it's been strongly discounted in markets, and I might argue it's been slightly over discounted in markets. What does that mean? I think that set us up now. Um, if if markets stay kind of at, at these levels as we head into towards the the November the third date, and and actually the days after, because it can take a while for 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 the results to be announced, as as we know. Um, I think the market is set up for a bit of a rebound, no matter which candidate wins. I think just the removal of uncertainty and, and the, um, the reality of, of a, transition and a transition happening, um, we'll have to see what Congress does, if it needs to play a role, if it, if it needs to step up. Um, but, but as that, as that, continues, I think the markets will be relieved. Markets hate uncertainty and we'll get a little bit of a bounce. I, I, I'm not saying it's going to be a huge bounce, but I think it's over discounted and we're now set up for that kind of reaction. Thank you. Andrew, do you have any comment on that? I, I guess yeah. talk about I mean, uncertainty and its relationship to gold. Well, yeah, certainly. I mean, obviously, I, you know, as I mentioned, I mean, gold, gold tends to perform uh, well uh, in more uncertain environments. But I think the bigger... The bigger longer term issue is is the the us china relationship not just a trade relationship but geopolitical and one area of um of similarity between biden and trump is really their approach to to china and their view on on china i wouldn't expect um the us policy towards china to change that much uh, even with biden it might be communicated in a softer, more professional way, but the underlying policy will still probably be the same. And I think that that's, that's the big, uh, you know, uncertainty that the, the world is facing at the moment from a, not just from a trade standpoint, but geopolitical as well. And on trade, um, what I think we're seeing is, you know, is a more regionalization, partly driven by COVID, partly driven by, um, uh, the Trump administration, but when you look at COVID and um, the reliance that many markets had on just-in-time manufacturing, for example, it's sort of reevaluating whether 
you need to not repatriate manufacturing but have more sustainable uh, in, a, in an economic sense in a, a supply chain sense more sustainable supply chains and more diverse supply chains and I think markets like Vietnam for example will will certainly benefit from that so I think we're going to see a regionalization an increased regionalization but for me the big the big issue is the US China relationship and that, I, I, that's probably not going to change much uh, even if, if Biden wins. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, a question has come in specifically related to any views that either of you might have on the uh, Cambodian economy and prospects. I don't know whether those are markets that you, that Cambodia is a market that you would like to comment on, but if you have any comment, with, I think that would be a good answer for the question. Yeah, Don, we, we, we don't invest in, in, in Cambodia. There's, there's not enough liquidity in, in the listed market there for us and, and, and we only invest in in listed securities. Um, what I would say though to the, the question which which talks about um, you know what's there are some different forecasts around for, for 20 and 21 as to how that economy is, is going to come out of, of the COVID crisis out of the recession. What I would say is again there's going to be a difference between developing economies and the more developed economies and the more developed economies have already got an advantage in, in the crisis so far. They've been more resilient because they've been more resilient. They're going to start from a better place as the recovery takes hold in the, in the global economy and they're going to benefit more from that global recovery. I think the less developed economies, and, and, and I hope it's okay for me to, to put Cambodia into that bucket because I don't know a lot about the, the Cambodian economy. But if I do, then its ability to emerge from the crisis will depend very much on, on fighting the disease and, and, and with its health system. And that, I think for a country like Cambodia and many Asian countries um, will depend critically on the vaccine vaccine distribution logistics, how quickly those refrigerated logistics can be established if they need to be established, and, and getting 60% plus of the population vaccinated. That may require actually two vaccines, depending on the efficacy of, of the vaccine that comes out. Um, so it's a tough road ahead, and, and a lot will depend on how that the medical emergency is tackled that then allows the economy to get back to work. And I think that's why there are some very different forecasts around for how these economies will do, because at this point in time, there's a huge uh, number of assumptions that have to be made, and there's relatively little data in how those economies will recover. We know from the Chinese economy how a large superpower uh, with a with a very well-developed health system and a, and a well-developed economy, we can, we've seen how that can recover. And we've got the example of the US as well, but we haven't yet been through that cycle for the less, less developed economies. Yeah, just, I would just add that there is, you know, the Cambodia in ASEAN is, is very um, strong um, political links to, to China. Um, their economy is, is certainly, um, I think it's fair to say much more integrated with with China as it's a key partner in the BRI, for example. Um, so I would expect to see a bit of a, you know, more of in the longer term, post COVID, because um, all countries will get through this eventually. Um, but post COVID, I you know, I'd expect to see that um, uh, you know C that Cambodia is sort of more intertwined with with China going forward. Okay. Well, I, um, uh, moderator's prerogative. I have visited Cambodia. I mean, haven't been able to go this year, obviously, but had many visits to Cambodia. And our our group does have operations in Cambodia. And I, I think that your points about the handling of the COVID crisis. I mean, Cambodia is, has. I'm looking at the Worldometer site at the moment. A very very low rate of infection reported so far. Seems to be managing the crisis well. Uh, my experience in, in our EU ASEAN Business Council interactions with Cambodia has been one of the most open countries in the region for foreign investment um, and a very flexible economy. Uh, they, need, they know that they have work to do on infrastructure. They're doing a lot on infrastructure um, and to improve the logistical efficiency of the economy. 
But um, I mean, I would say if they continue, as you've pointed out, to manage the uh, the COVID situation well, and that flexibility remains, and chi having a con connections with China, given that China's economy seems to be doing relatively better than other large economies, those are all those are all good things. So um, you know, I, I personally think there's the medium and long term prospects are good, and as you said, the short term depends a lot on the uh, questions around uh, the, the COVID uh, management. Um, could could we? I have a um, Chris is asking another question here. I'm trying to see what Chris, you just sent me something, but it disappeared off my screen. You want to put it up again? Um, I have a question related to the, we go back to the, the your, your Swishonomics bill. Um, I hope you've patented or copyrighted that. Um, it's a, that's a good term. Uh, we Abe nomics is now behind us. So we need something new, uh, a new nomics. So we'll go with Swishonomics. There's, I guess, embedded somehow in your in your thinking, is is a time when that beginning of the swish up would start, and that must be dependent on some assumptions about when we reach the point of vaccine or cure or stability, uh, herd immunity or whatever you think is going to turn go from that dot at the bottom of your chart to start pushing up that next leg of the return. Can you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about that question as you're as you're building models and, and making decisions on asset allocation? Sure. So I, th I think, in fact, we're already past that that point. Um, I might even quickly be able to to bring the the slide back up. Um, we're already past that point, um, and. Um, sorry, let me do it. Hopefully you can see it there. So. What happened was, as I said, that it, it was a bit like you turned off the power to a machine and, and it just stopped. I mean, the, the economy almost ground to a, to a complete stop very, very rapidly, uh, an exogenous shock. As the electricity came back on by means of policy stimulus, monetary fiscal policy stimulus, uh, and the disease coming under control, we got this very sharp rebound. Um, and in a sense, that's kind of the easy bit because when you put the electricity back on, um, if you get even a small amount of output from the economy, from the machine, that small amount is now compared to a very, very low base. Uh, you've gone down a lot. So, so the initial part of the bounce back can be very sharp. The initial part of the recovery can be a kind of V-shaped. I think we've now reached this inflection point at B where it's going to be much flatter. And actually what this doesn't show is that I think there's going to be permanent scarring to the economy. So this swoosh very conveniently on this chart gets us back to where we started. But I think in reality it's going to be flatter and there's going to be permanent scarring. We're not going to go back to where we started because there are going to be corporations that go out of business. There's going to be permanent damage to the economy. This part, as you quite rightly say, Don, is very dependent. So the assumption that's gone in here is that um, a vaccine becomes available towards the end of this year, but really goes into mass distribution through the first half of next year. Um, and, and that it's gone kind of into a good amount of, of distribution and helped to protect kind of the herd, the, the societal herd uh, by the end of next year. That's the assumption that's built into here. And so far that looks to be on track. As you know, the FDA in the US are doing an expedited process for approving vaccines. The leading candidates, uh, the Pfizer, the Moderna in, in, in North America, and in, in the UK, the, the, the Oxford one, which is being developed in, in conjunction with Astra. There's an Italian vaccine, there's a German vaccine. Of course, there's Chinese vaccines, there's Russian vaccines. I think that's all happening. We did wonder for a while whether the vaccines would come quickly enough for us to have more of a V-shaped recovery. So for this point B to actually be much higher up here and for us to be in this rapid recovery 
V-shaped scenario. But I think that time has gone. I think the base case now is for the vaccine to roll out, as I, as I just described, and then for us to have this much slower grind back towards some semblance of normality, but with a good amount of scarring in the economy. So we won't get back to where we started. We'll, we'll, we'll have some permanent damage. Okay. Thank you. Let me, let me um, we're getting near the end of the time. I wanted to touch on one other subject, one other question before we um, uh, wrapped up. And that's around um, green investing, or I guess more broadly ESG. Um, I mean, obviously in the world of asset management, this is a theme which has gathered enormous momentum in the last few years, not just driven by climate change, but to a great extent, I think, uh, related to climate change. But with that comes a whole range of other issues around the SD, the social development goals, et cetera. And of course, corporate governance, which has long been on the agenda. Um, it, just as we think about ASEAN, maybe just close as we think about ASEAN, do you see green investing as a major impactful theme in the region going forward? And is there any, any way that you would see that playing a role in how uh, the investment environment looks? Uh, more attractive countries or are there, is there, how countries respond in terms of ESG or, or companies respond, could that drive performance differences? Hmm. So I'll, 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 I'll have a stab uh, first. So I, I think we are seeing much more green investing, climate change driven and, and, and otherwise responsible investing social development goals, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if you think now, the UNPRI, the Principles for Responsible Investing, uh, the initial signatories, which um, we, were, we were one, were, was in, in 2006. So it's been a while. And, and that initial thrust was about integration. That was a commitment by a, a large number of organizations in the end, a very large number of asset owners, asset managers, to take into account ES and G factors into every investment decision they make. So that means whenever we look at a stock or a bond, we need to be cognizant of the, of the ES and G factors that are affecting that stock. It doesn't mean that you can't buy a sinful company. You can't, you can't buy a, a bad company, a thermal coal producer or a, or a mountaintop removal company or, or something like that. But you have to have taken the, the, the ESG factors into account. I think the world has now moved on. That, that, that's kind of just assumed to be the case by all investors, that all asset managers will do that. And people are looking for more. They increasingly want more. So they want those ESG insights that people are supposed to have in, in reaching investment decisions to have a, a positive impact, both in terms of generating performance and in terms of doing good for the world, in terms of helping the climate transition, in terms of helping other things. So clients want, want more and more. They don't want to give up performance, but, but they want more and more impactful stuff. Um, so it's an increasing challenge to investors, um, to investment managers. Um, we see in Asia um, a lot more disclosure going on around this from corporates, which is very helpful. We see a lot more interest in asset owners as there's a generational shift, particularly in family wealth terms. The new generation is much more interested in this than the, than the outgoing generation. So we're having a lot more discussions with, with the new wealth owners than, than with the original, the first generation wealth owners. Also, the universe of green bonds, for example, is increasing very quickly in Asia. I mean, that's only one type of green investment, but, but it's an interesting one and an important one. And the issuance of green bonds has been going up. Again, I think the scale of the challenges is very different between um, an emerging economy, a less developed economy. Again, let's pick Indonesia, still has, for example, a lot of thermal coal extractors. A lot of investors don't want to have thermal coal in, in their portfolios. They want investment managers to uh, make pledges that they won't invest in those thermal coal companies. 
that's a problem for Indonesia. Its economy is still very reliant on, on that and other kind of mineral extraction industries. And, and it would be unfair to, to kind of cut off financing to a developing country like that. Other more developed countries like Singapore, for example, have been in the lead in issuing green bonds, for example. There's, there's some real estate companies, um, some REITs in Singapore, which are very focused on having green buildings and, and they've kind of led the way and, and that's fantastic. So very, very, uh, you know, a whole spectrum in, in, in ASEAN in this rapidly evolving and, and increasingly important area. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I think investors are recognizing a couple of things. One, there isn't necessarily a trade-off between performance and sustainability. Um, that sustainable companies tend to uh, certainly be a proxy for being able to deal with external shocks better, such as COVID. There was a survey in the UK where, I can't remember the exact figure, but it was over 90% of, um, of asset managers and IFAs um, expected sustainable finance to, to increase. And one of the main reasons was um, uh, with sustainable companies um, or having good corporate business practices being a proxy for being able to weather um, other types of, of shock, such as COVID. When it comes to ASEAN, I mean, there's a huge infrastructure deficit and that can or should be plugged through sustainable finance. But I think there's, there's a number of things that need to be done. Um, I know the EU ABC put out a paper on sustainable finance um, a couple of months ago, but you know, key things, one, as Bill said, disclosure, and perhaps um, not necessarily a standardization of, of a definition um, of, of sustainability because that can be quite restrictive but I think work needs to be done to standardize disclosures and and information provision increased transparency and developing some kind of, of taxonomy that is um, that is flexible enough to not just focus on on green issues which are incredibly important but also the s and the g and certainly just as I close the, the gold industry um, it's quite unique in that there are lots of sustainability challenges um, that the industry faces, particularly on the S and the G front. If you look at um, where gold is, is often mined, um, the, the role of the artisanal sector, uh, there's all sorts of issues from labor rights, um, uh, con uh, avoiding conflicted areas, um, uh, good supply chain management and rooting out corruption, things like that. That's upstream. Then downstream, you have all sorts of things, AML, TF rules and so on that have to be dealt with as well. So sustainability for the gold industry is a... Uh, you know, is, is a is a big um, it, it's a big um, a big area. Um, but the, the the industry certainly the the large producers and um, the traders and the bullion banks um, that, that participate in the gold market have really over the last 10, 15 years implemented a lot of steps to try and um, um, you know address uh, ESG more broadly. But going back to the question, yeah, I think um, it, it's key. Um, it will grow. Um, but there are things that, you know, as the EU ABC has pointed out, that need to be done in ASEAN to, to help sort of facilitate the growth of sustainable finance. Thank you very much. And I, I you know, I want to thank both of you for, um, it's gone quickly. Um, I, I think we've, it's, a quite, it's been a broad discussion. We've covered a lot of issues. Um, it's clear that, um, you know, uncertainty is going to be with us, but I believe we've, We've provided, Bill has provided some grounds for an overall um, framework for thinking about a recovery. Um, it's good to hear your belief that we've, we've reached that uh, inflection point and it's the, all the arrows are still basically pointing up. Um, Andrew, thank you for educating us on the role of gold in portfolios and some of the, some of the drivers behind uh, the gold market. And, and thank you both for thoughts around ESG and, and greening of the economies and the importance of, of going beyond mere ESG to having positive impact and the role that that could play in, in the economies of our region. With that, I will turn it back to Chris Humphrey to close us. Thank you, Don. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Bill. Uh, very enjoyable conversation. And the, the hour certainly passed very, very quickly. Uh, just a quick advert for everybody else listening future webinars coming up from the Business Council on various aspects of the digital economy in ASEAN. The first of those will be on digital economy and taxation issues. 
which should be on the 9th of October. Please look out for the adverts for that. Otherwise, again, thanks to our moderator, thanks to our panel, and I keep uh, wish everybody to keep well, keep safe, and keep happy. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye.